2017 CF 15684, State v. Nelson, back from our recess. Ms. Morris, defense ready to proceed? Yes. Mr. Nelson, are you ready? Yes. Mr. Nelson, State? Yes. Doctor, are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, let's please bring in the jury. So, Dr. McLean, I had asked whether, um, in your opinion, whether he was living with an extreme emotional or emotion, excuse me, extreme mental or emotional disturbance at the time of the incident in September of 2017. Uh, I do have an opinion about that. And what is your opinion? Um, based upon my review of the documentation from the Bureau of Prisons, um, the fact that he had been provided with medication and treated for um, a mood disorder, as well as having frank psychotic symptoms identified at periods of time while in the Bureau of Prisons, I did make the opinion that at the time of the events leading to the current offenses, that he was suffering from extreme emotional disturbance. Um, based upon my review of records and in talking with Mr. Nelson about the events leading up to the crimes. And um, do you believe that the cognitive deficits that we've discussed and this extreme emotional disturbance affects his ability to follow the law? Objection. Same objection as before. I'll sustain the objection to the form of the question. Do you believe that it affects his conduct? My opinion is that his ability to regulate his behavior um, at the time of the events leading up to the offense, as well as previously, is impacted by his history of head trauma, coupled with his documented history of a mental disturbance, and that at the time of the events leading up to the offense, he was not treated for his mental disorder. So I do think that his ability to regulate his behaviors was definitely impacted by them. And... Um, may I just have one moment, Judge? Yes. You indicated that um, you listened to his statement to law enforcement, right? Yes. And you spoke with him about his um, sort of emotional state uh, leading up to the events in, in September of 2017. Is that right? Correct. And so you heard when he described himself as having been emotionally dead or dying that night. That's correct. And um, was that important to you in making your decisions about all of this? I think that it was definitely a part of my decision making. Um, basically, my overall opinion was greatly impacted by my review of the records and the long history of documented mental health issues going as far back as 2004 and that the particular statements made reflected not only the mood disturbance but also self-injurious behaviors as well as paranoid type of beliefs. So my opinion is focused on the review of documents but also the fact that he was untreated at the time of the events leading up to the offenses. And being untreated um, for these types of mood disorders and mental health issues, um, would the feeling of being emotionally dead be consistent with the diagnoses that you've talked about? Uh, specifically with respect to depression, severe depression. Judge may have just one more moment. Yes. I don't have any other questions at this time. Further examination. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. The Bureau of Prison Records about Mr. Uh, Mr. Nelson are very extensive, aren't they? They are very extensive. They go back to something like 2004, I believe. Yes, sir. And. In those records, there are references to Mr. Nelson's behavior being manipulative, aren't there? 
There definitely are. Now, Doctor, you did not ask Mr. Nelson anything about his thought processes, his mental status, what was going on in his mind at the time he murdered Jennifer Fulford, did you? No, I did not specifically address mental state at the time of the offense. So you did not ask him anything about the facts of the crime, did you? I did not ask about the facts of the crime. Now, Doctor, you're not a lawyer, are you? Absolutely not. So you, none of the opinions that you have offered today are legal opinions, are they? My opinions are offered within a reasonable degree of psychological certainty. So none of your opinions that you have offered today are legal opinions, are they, Dr. McLean? They are not. Now, Doctor, you talked about uh, the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder that you found in the Department of Correct, I'm sorry, the, the Bureau of Prison Records. Do you disagree with that diagnosis? Yes. And I believe you disagree with that diagnosis. Well, let me back up, Doctor. Antisocial personality disorder, uh, before the most recent uh, versions of the naming system that are used, had another name, didn't it? Yes. And that was sociopathy, wasn't it? Grounds? Yes. Doctor, uh, antisocial personality used to be called sociopathy, didn't it? It actually didn't. The formal diagnosis was not called sociopathic personality disorder. It was called antisocial personality disorder. It has previously been called sociopathy, hasn't it, doctor? It has not been called sociopathic personality disorder in the previously DSM. Previously been called psychopathic personality disorder, too, hasn't it? I, I don't agree with you, and in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual used for psychologists and psychiatrists, there is not a psychopathic personality disorder or sociopathic personality disorder. Those terms are not in current use, are they? Those terms were not listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as formal diagnoses. It was antisocial personality disorder. Has always been antisocial personality disorder? Is that your testimony? My... In the DSM-4, DSM-4-TR, and the DSM-5, there is not a sociopathic personality disorder or a psychopathic personality disorder. Has it ever been in any of the earlier diagnostic and statistical manuals, doctor? Um, my familiarity with the diagnostic and statistical manual is that there's terms, lay person terms, called sociopathy and psychopathic deviant, but as far as diagnosing them, it's been antisocial personality disorder. Since the DSM-4? Yes, absolutely. What's the year of the DSM-4, doctor? I think it's early, maybe early 2000s. So if there's a DSM-4, obviously there was a DSM-1, 2, and 3, weren't there? To my knowledge, yes. And you're not familiar with those diagnostic and statistical manuals, are you? I have not diagnosed with them, no. They're Thank not you, contemporary. Now, doctor, I believe you said that one of the problems you had with the Bureau of Prisons diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder was that you saw no proof of onset prior to the age of 15. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, doctor, absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of absence, is it? Absence of evidence is not the same thing as, can you repeat that? Evidence of absence. I'm not sure how that applies. Just because you're not sure how that applies. I, I'm not because okay, thank you, specifically. Doctor. Now, but doctor has has I'm missed. Object to not allowing the witness to answer a question. I'm going to sustain the objection. If you believe it's non-responsive, Mr. Nolley, you need to make that objection. 
The Bureau of Prisons have not diagnosed Mr. Nelson as bipolar disordered, have they? Not to my knowledge, no. I believe you said that they diagnosed Mr. Nelson with a, a mood disorder? They diagnosed him with depression and mood disorder. And the mood disorder was adjustment disorder, right? Initially, yes. Depression is one of the most common mental state diagnoses made, isn't it? It's fairly frequent, yes. It's very frequent, isn't it? It's fairly frequent, yes. And doctor, you said that uh, there were embellishments contained with, within uh, parts of Mr. Nelson's statement to law enforcement, I believe. Did I hear that right? That's absolutely correct. So did you ask him directly about those statements that you believe to be embellishments or exaggerations? No. Would that not be important to you? Not really, no. But yet you think he embellished and exaggerated? Um, what I think is that it was very dramatic is the word I would use. You think it's very dramatic? Correct. Many of his statements are very dramatic. And you didn't think it was important to ask him why he made those dramatic statements, did you? I asked him about what he was thinking. I didn't ask him specific facts about the case. Now, Doctor, I believe that you said that Mr. Nelson is impulsive. That is correct. That's one of the hallmarks of antisocial personality disorder, isn't it? It's one of the criteria. Did you, uh, did you speak with anyone to attempt to gain further insight into Mr. Nelson's um, experiences within the federal prison system? I have not spoken with anybody else within the prison system. So the only person you talked to directly face to face about this case was Scott Edward Nelson, wasn't it? That's correct. And Mr. Nelson is, of course, the defendant in this case, isn't he? That's correct. Mr. Nelson has quite a bit to gain from your testimony, doesn't he? Can I object? I'll roll the objection. Mr. Nelson has quite a bit to gain from favorable testimony offered by you, doesn't he? I would disagree. What's the concept of secondary gain in the context of a forensic psychological evaluation, doctor? Uh, the concept of secondary gain would be that there is um, basically rewards or reinforcement such that the person may be motivated to present information that would be in their best interest. You relied upon Mr. Nelson's self-report about his experiences within the Federal Bureau of Prisons, didn't you, doctor? That was part of it, yes. And you relied upon the records from the Federal Bureau of Prisons also, didn't you? That's correct, sir. And those records contained references to manipulative behavior by Mr. Nelson to get something that he wanted, didn't they? Yes, there are some references to that, definitely. Now, you are taking, I believe, as true that Mr. Nelson was sexually assaulted in 2015. Is that correct? I am. Did you find any supporting documentation within the Federal Bureau of Prisons records to substantiate Mr. Nelson's claim? I didn't see to this specific extent, no. So the answer is no, you did not find such information, isn't it? Correct. Doctor, you said that Mr. Nelson is hypervigilant, I believe you said. Is that the phrase you used? That's correct. Of course, hypervigilance in prison is not such a bad idea generally, is it? I would agree. And no, no neurological imaging was done of Mr. Nelson, was it? Not to my knowledge, sir. So...
you know, the best we can say, I suppose, is that Mr. Nelson has a mild neurocognitive dis disorder or may have such a disorder. Is that a fair way to put it? Uh, the results from the testing place him in very low percentages that would be suggestive of major neurocognitive disorder as well. So a mild neurocognitive dis disorder at worst, correct? Um, I think I just said that the deficits in memory actually place him in a more severe range. Do you recall me taking your deposition in June, doctor? That's correct. Do you recall testifying that it was a mild neurocognitive disorder? Sorry? I'm objecting to improper impeachment. I'll overrule the objection. Do you recall telling me, doctor, when I took your deposition on June the 3rd of this year that Mr. Nelson had a mild neurocognitive disorder? That is my opinion. Okay. Now, from 2003 to 2017, we have Bureau of Prisons records about Mr. Nelson, don't we? Correct, sir. At no point in time over that 14-year period was Mr. Nelson ever diagnosed as bipolar, was he? He was not specifically diagnosed bipolar. So the answer is no. Correct. Mr. Nelson was not diagnosed as post-traumatic stress disorder at any point in time by the Bureau, Bureau of Prisons between 2003 and 2017, was he? That's correct. The Bureau of Prison Records include numerous frequent psychological evaluations of Mr. Nelson by prison personnel, don't they? As far as... Um Psychological evaluations, I didn't see psychological evaluation in the Bureau of Prisons records. The Bureau of Prisons said records reflect that Mr. Nelson was depressed, don't they? They do. That he had adjustment disorder. Correct. And that he was antisocial personality disordered, don't they? That's correct. Now, Doctor, moving back in time in your testimony this morning to the, the testimony that you gave about Mr. Nelson as a child and the adverse childhood experiences, is it fair to say that much of that information comes from Mr. Nelson? I think it's fair to say that Mr. Nelson's self-report is a significant part of completion of that questionnaire. And this is a self-report by a person whom you have described as prone to embellishment and making dramatic statements, isn't it? No, I, I don't think I made that comment with regard to the completion of the aversive childhood experiences questionnaire. I think I made that statement with regard to some very dramatic statements within his statements to law enforcement. With regard to yes or no, um, there is not much embellishment in the yes or no responses to the ACE. But you do recognize, you do acknowledge that what you have said that Mr. Nelson is prone to exaggeration and embellishment, don't you? I made a comment that with regard to his statements to law enforcement, there were parts of it such as, as an example, blood pizza, that was a dr very dramatic statement, but with regard to a generalization as to him um, malingering or faking, I did not, not make that statement. Okay, so you don't, you don't think he was exaggerating with the adverse childhood experience questionnaire? Is that your testimony? Yes, that's correct. But you recognize he, you think he was exaggerating previously. I think he can be dramatic. He turns it on and off, doesn't he? Pardon? Does he turn it on and off? I think there's definitely periods in which he's more dramatic and then periods where he's more depressed and very flat. So, Doctor, is it, uh, is it your testimony that, um, assuming that the ACE, the adverse childhood experiences scoring is correct, that means that Mr. Nelson may be more prone to heart disease or depression? Is that what it means? 
Um, there's certainly suggestions in the literature and the research that he would be, yes. Well, that's based on the research and the literature. Correct, sir. Okay. Now, doctor, you talked about head injuries sustained, I believe, you identified four of them, I believe. Yes, sir. Um, there's a difference between a head injury and a traumatic brain injury, isn't there? Uh, in terms of categorization, I would agree with you. And you did not see any medical records relating to these head injuries, did you? No, sir, I don't have medical records detailing the um, head injuries or the brain scans or anything. Okay, so, well, doctor, let me ask you this. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the Glasgow Coma Scale, aren't you? Absolutely. That is a, what is it? Tell us what that is. Basically, it's a measure that's used in order to determine the responsiveness of an individual who's had some type of trauma. And you don't have a Glasgow Coma Scale score for any of Mr. Nelson's purported head injuries, do you, doctor? I don't. Your Honor, if I may have just one moment to consult. Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect. Dr. McLean, um, this is a copy of the most current DSM, correct? That's correct. And the DSM, I believe you said, has changed over time? Correct. And I think when, on direct, we talked a little about autism spectrum disorder. So that is one example of the way that it's changed. Is that right? Correct. There's also other terms or diagnoses that the psychological community has decided are inappropriate to use. Is that right? Right. One classic example is mental retardation versus intellectual disability. And um, there are things like whole diagnoses of, like, say, things like homosexuality as a mental illness or things like that that have, are removed from the DSM. Is that right? Correct. There's been conceptual changes. Okay. And so the book itself and the features and names of things have changed to, to fit what is current psychology and, and, and neuropsychology theories, is that right? Correct. And um, so the term, and I believe that you said this on cross, but I just wanted to clarify, it has always been antisocial personality disorder. Just within the time that I practiced in psychology since 1992, it's been antisocial personality disorder. There have been terms coined in the community of psychopathic deviate and sociopathy, sociopathy rep representing a pattern of behavior. And it is a violation of the law, a violation of other people's rights, irresponsibility, reckless disregard. So those are terms that, that have been used in the community but are not proper under the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. Is that correct? Within... Objection leading. I'll sustain the objection of the form. Are they, are they appropriate under the Diagnostic and, Statist Diagnostic and Statistical Manual? Um, with regard to being appropriate or not, it's um, more a matter of specific diagnoses and the way they're labeled. And so it's called antisocial personality disorder. Okay, and so I want to ask you a little bit about that. Um, Mr. Nunnally asked you if manipulative behavior is a common criteria or one of the criteria of antisocial personality disorder. Is that right? Correct. And... Um, Manipulative behavior, in your experience and reading of the research, is common behavior in prison. Is that, is that fair? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, are there a different set of social norms that happen in prison than happen outside? Um, with regard to incarceration, um, long-term incarceration or short-term incarceration, there is definitely a different set of norms with regard to how to effectively interact, and I say that loosely, because it's not really effective, but it's used in order to maybe jockey for a placement in a different unit, different pod, to go, for instance, from general population to isolation. Um, and it varies. The behaviors may vary from suicidal gestures to, you know, 
physical type of symptoms? So um, because someone has exhibited manipulative behavior while in prison, does that mean that they have antisocial personality disorder? That's not conclusive, no. And um, in your review of the records where it indicates there's manipulative behavior, are there other indications to suggest that um, his mental illness and things like that are, are real? Well, I'm going to go by my review of the Bureau of Prisons record and whatever they call it diagnostically, for example, an adjustment disorder would not be an adjustment disorder anymore after six months. So in other words, it might be called an adjustment disorder, but if they're still treating for depression, it's no longer an adjustment disorder. But the symptoms that are described is what I was referring to, which is the anxiety, the depression, the paranoid type of thoughts and ideas that they're talking about several times in review of the records, and he's treated for those. And those symptoms are actually described um, in the records, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, the, in the records, it shows that the defendant, or that, that Mr. Nelson regularly was filing lawsuits because of poor treatment. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. And um, is it, is that considered manipulative behavior by the Federal Bureau of Prisons? I would think so. I'll sustain the objection. In the records, does it indicate that he's filing complaints and lawsuits because he's not being treated fairly? Correct. And, and not being given safe housing or appropriate food or those types of things, is that right? That's correct. And so it's basic needs that he's complaining about. I think he's complaining about basic needs as well as the environmental conditions. Okay. And um, the antisocial personality disorder, in your experience, is that a common diagnosis by prison psychiatrists? I think it is very frequent diagnosis um, within the prison system. Um, and you were talking about um, mood disorders. Mr. Nunnally pointed out that it doesn't specifically diagnose bipolar disorder in the records. Can you tell us what the criteria for bipolar disorder is? Certainly. There is distinctive episodes of depression, which the person has appetite changes, sleep changes, um, <sighs> difficulties with motivation, suicidal ideation, possibly at times, that alternate then with periods of excessive energy, um, sleeplessness, um, racing thoughts, pressured speech. Are those criteria, or the symptoms of those criteria expressed in the records? Yes. And so even if they don't have a specific diagnosis, you see evidence of that. Is that accurate? There, there are symptoms described that are suggestive of mood swings, agitation, anxiety, also psychotic episodes that is mentioned in the notes from the prison. What is labeled is something that's basically like a mood disorder or adjustment disorder. But again, adjustment disorder by definition is not an adjustment disorder if it persists longer than six months. And in the records, are they labeling adjustment disorder longer than six months? To my knowledge, yes. So that would be an inaccurate diagnosis as well? After six months. Um, the state asked you a little bit about the adverse childhood experiences, and he indicated that it means they're prone to depression and, and heart disease. But that's not all that they're prone to. Is that right? Nope, that's definitely not all. There's um, basically it's health risk factors and then associated with diabetes, heart disease, emphysema. There's various different disorders. And so they're associated with physical health disorders, but also mental health problems. That that's correct. Okay. And um, <laughs> the adverse childhood experience theory, is that separate than what we were talking about, about trauma's effect on your brain development? It's, it's part of as well. Okay, and so is it your opinion that these adverse childhood experiences make him more prone to the things we were talking about, but also affected his brain development? Yes. Okay. Um, 
The state also asked you if the adverse childhood experiences were based on Mr. Nelson's self-report. Um, you, what else did you review that corroborated those things? Well, I think two major pieces of documentation were the admission of the mother to the mental health hospital, which there's documentation of that, as well as the father's criminogenic behavior, and there's documentation of newspaper articles and the actual charging document for the father's behavior. So those are two other pieces of information that I think are very, very important. Okay. And um, did you also review James Nelson's interview? Yes. And did Mr. James Nelson corroborate the things regarding um, physical abuse, domestic violence, things like that, that Mr. Nelson described? Correct. Um, and then I wanted to talk about, we talked about head injuries or brain damage um, on direct, and then you were asked some on cross. Um, a number of the injuries that we talked about, Mr. Nelson was uh, young or an, a child to early adulthood. Is that right? My knowledge is that it was from approximately eight years old until 1980. 1980 would have been 16 years old. Okay. And um, in the 70s and 80s, was um, our medical treatment of head injuries substantially different than it is now? A simple response is yes. And um, the just because you don't have medical records of of these types of things, does, well, let me ask you this: Are, in your opinion, after reviewing the data and the testing, does Mr. Nelson have executive dysfunction? Well, I think I stated at the beginning of my testimony that I did review the raw data provided by the doctors, which detailed the memory testing, the intellectual testing, the executive testing. I also reviewed their summaries, and that was for Dr. Wo, Dr. Mings, and Dr. Woods. And so my opinions were based upon the review of the data, which suggests the deficits that be consistent with mild, at least mild, neurocognitive disorder. And some of the data points suggest even greater deficits. Okay. And so regardless of what the cause of that dysfunction is, there's clear dysfunction. Is that accurate? Uh, with regard to diagnostic um, labels, it's consistent with a past history of head trauma, okay. uh, as well as um, you know, possibly other contributing factors, such as substance abuse. The, um, you, he had, on cross-examination, he pointed out that your opinion was mild cognitive impairment. I can't remember the exact words. Um, is it true that overall it may be mild, but there are areas that are, are more signi significant? Yeah, and I think that's... Lady, I'll sustain the objection. What is your opinion about his cognitive deficits in general? Well, in general, that as I stated in deposition, it would be consistent with like what I would label a mild neurocognitive disorder. However, there are memory deficits that would be more consistent with major problems as far as a possible dementing type of disorder or progressive disorder that needs to be monitored. Um, but again, there is one set of data points, not a second set of data points. So in other words, to really properly determine if it's a progressive disorder, it would have to be re-administered to see if, in fact, that's the case. So basically, there are definitely executive deficits noted in the data. There's also deficits for memory. Okay. And um, within the deficits, there are some areas that are worse than others. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes, it's accurate. And um, would you classify some areas as severe? Deficits? Um, with regard to the memory, yes. Okay. And that's based upon the percentiles. That's not based upon a subjective opinion. It's based on percentiles. And um, do you know or do you have the percentiles of what you're talking about? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Can you tell um, us? Specifically in Dr. Woe's uh, evaluation, 
very specific uh, percentiles um, with respect to learning and memory. Um, on a learning and memory measure is basically over five trials. He was at the first percentile. That means that 99% of similar age peers uh, would be functioning higher than he was in that. So his ability to learn information and retain that information fell within the first percentile. So that would be very low. Also on the recall memory from the Ray complex figure, figure which is a non-verbal task, uh, it also was first percentile for short delay and first percentile for delayed recall. So there was no improvement over time. Um, so there was deficits for both verbal learning as well as nonverbal recall. And um, again, regardless of how these deficits occurred, um, is it, or in your opinion, do those deficits affect his ability to make decisions? Yes. And um, do they affect impulsivity? Yes. And do they affect um, planning skills? They do, yes. The state asked you about the sexual assault that Mr. Nelson experienced in prison. Um, there was some corroboration in the records, is that correct? Correct. And um, can you tell us about that? What Mr. Um, Nelson reported to me was that he was basically hit in the back of the head, lost consciousness, and was sexually assaulted. Those specific details were not noted. Okay, but there was an indication of an assault at the same time period that Mr. Nelson described. Correct. Okay. And, um, were there follow-up indications later on where Mr. Nelson is asking for medical treatment or things like that because of an, a sexual assault? Correct. Judge, may I just have one moment? Yes. Judge, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Doctor, you can step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Council approach. All right, members of the jury, in uh, just a moment, we're going to take a uh, lunch recess. During the lunch recess, you're going to continue to leave your notepads and your pens here. During the lunch recess, you are under all the court's instructions, including but not limited to the instruction not to discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Uh, we'll plan to continue the presentation of the evidence at 1.30 p.m. this afternoon. So just follow the deputy's instructions where you need to be. Thank you for your service this morning. Enjoy your lunch. We'll see you at 1.30. Ms. Simmons. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I provided the three motions to the court this morning. Um, I would, I guess, re-invoke the rule of sequestration regarding Dr. Pritchard at this point for argument of the motions. Well, let's, let's first bring up this motion about um, Mr. Nelson. Yes, sir. Since that would be the next thing in terms of time sequence. Yes, sir. Um, what I can tell you about our motion is that um, the first part deals with the right to allocution at sentencing generally, and that it is a right at a general sentencing hearing um, to the 
accused to speak to the sentencer um, without being cross-examined. More specifically, as it deals in the, in the capital context before a jury, um, I was unable to find anything specifically on point or allowing it. Um, there was case law saying that it was not error or not an abuse of discretion to disallow allocution before the uh, capital jury. But um, those cases are certainly before Hearst and before the corresponding uh, changes to the statute. And so we're arguing that the court is not bound by those. Um, given the situation that we find ourselves in now, Specifically, the Troy versus State case that I cited on the second page, 948 Southern 2nd, 635, um, discussed the fact that New Jersey had allowed allocution at close of penalty phase before the jury, but distinguished it because in New Jersey, the jury is the sentencer and it wasn't an advisory verdict. Uh, and at the time in Florida, the jury verdict was a was advisory either way. And so the defendant always had the opportunity to allocute at the Spencer hearing. Now, the jury has more of a definitive sentencing role. Um, there's a possibility that there may not be a Spencer hearing at which Mr. Nelson could be heard. And so the, I guess the, the reasons in Troy that cured the issue are not present here. And so we would ask that Mr. Nelson be allowed to testify before the jury um, without cross-examination, more akin to a regular sentencing proceeding. Who's going to respond for the state, Mr. Nelson? Judge, the case cited by the defendant, uh, Troy versus State, clearly explains why Allocution in this context is not proper. Troy was subsequently followed by Smith versus State, and that's what he's named, 48 Southern 3rd, 838, for the pinpoint site, 870 through 871. The defendant's opportunity to allocute <coughs> comes in the Spencer hearing. It does not come in the context of and unsworn and apparently, you know, unrestrained opportunity to address the jury without being cross-examined. The case law in Florida is clear. Troy is controlling as is Smith, and it would be improper to allow Mr. Nelson allocution at this stage particularly in the absence of any sort of precedent which allows it. The state's position is that it's not proper, it's unnecessary, it's inappropriate at this point. If we get to a Spencer hearing, Mr. Nelson will have that opportunity. We are not there yet, and he does not yet have that opportunity. Ms. Simmons. Yes, Your Honor. I, I I thought I had added Smith to my um, motion, but I'm not sure if I printed a, a different version, but it was a late edition. My only response to the state's argument is that Smith is from 2009, so it again suffers the same issues as Troy being pre-Hearst. Uh, otherwise, I have nothing to add to my initial argument. So, Ms. Simmons, am I correct then? The only cases that have addressed the issue have held it's not an abuse of discretion for the trial court to deny the right of allocution. Correct. In, in I was Florida. Yes, I wasn't able to find anything post Hearst or post the amendments to the statute. And under the under the jury instructions at this phase, isn't the jury going to be instructed that the only thing it can consider is evidence in rendering its verdict? Yes, Judge, maybe I don't understand the court's question or... Well, my question is, is if 
If the court were to allow, to grant the defense motion, allow Mr. Nelson to render an allocution, then what would be the purpose? Because the, wouldn't the jury be instructed that they're only to consider evidence and evidence of witnesses they know has to be sworn before it, it can be considered by them, right? Judge, I think our main goal in the motion is not necessarily avoiding the swearing in, but avoiding the cross-examination. And so testimony would still be evidence for the jury to consider. And how would that be explained to the jury? How one particular person that would appear to them to be a witness is not treated like any other witness. Judge, I think it goes along with the victim impact witnesses. They read from statements. They didn't answer questions. They weren't cross-examined. I mean, obviously, at this point, a penalty phase is very different from the first phase, and I'm not sure that the jury would have any confusion with, with this um, procedure. But during the state's presentation of penalty phase evidence, although the defense chose not to cross-examination, they certainly had the right to do that, right? Yes, Your Honor, but it goes back to the fact that they read statements instead of being asked specific questions. Um, they were, the jury was admonished the victim impact evidence is not to be considered as aggravate, aggravating factors. So I think that there's sort of a precedent for confusing you know, how victim impact evidence can be used as evidence when they're not to consider it as, aggravating, as aggravation. All right. And we talked about the case law. Is there any statute or rule that has been adopted that speaks to allocution to a jury? Not that I could find. No. And that's a common law, right? And that's centuries old, isn't it? That's under the common law, and that was to the judge, never the jury, was it? Is there any case under the common law that allowed allocution to a jury? I was unable to find anything in support of from Florida in support of our request. However, I was also unable to find anything specifically saying it was improper after Hearst. So at this point, you know, the New Jersey case would be persuasive, obviously not controlling, but um, given that our statute is very different than it was during the time of Troy and Smith, we believe the court should change course as well. All right, the court's going to deny this particular motion. The, the right of allocation, allocution, as indicated uh, in the defense's own motion, uh, goes back centuries. It's a right under the common law. Clearly, the, the legislature, through its statutes, can abrogate the common law. The legislature, as far as I'm aware, has not done that. Uh, and then, certainly, the Florida Supreme Court, in its rulemaking capacity, could adopt a rule that specifically uh, alters the right of allocution to be not just as it has been under the common law and remains to this day before the court, but to the jury, that hasn't been done uh, either. Uh, and I understand the defense is requesting this circuit court to make that change. I uh, am not going to do that. I don't believe case law requires it. Uh, and I think if that's going to be done in the first instance, it should be done by uh, either the Florida Supreme Court, uh, an appellate court, or uh, the legislature of our state. So I'm going to deny the motion to allow allocution before the sentencing jury, just to be clear, that in no way affects Mr. Nelson's right to testify if he chooses as, as a witness in the penalty phase uh, as any other witness that the defense intends to present. I guess that'll be a good segue to getting to that. Ms. Simmons, have you had an opportunity to talk with Mr. Nelson about whether he's going to testify? Or have you finished those discussions? Judge, we spoke a little bit before, but now that Dr. McLean has decided we need a few more minutes to discuss it again. Um, Thank you, Your Honor. We're ready. I'm sorry, Ms. Simmons, you're ready? ready to proceed. Okay. All right, Mr. Nelson. Yes, Your Honor. You recall our uh, 
previous colloquy regarding your right to testify, your right not to testify. Right. Okay, that was in the first phase of the trial. Now we're in the second phase of the trial. And do you understand that just as in the first phase, you have the right to choose if you wish to take the stand and testify uh, during the defense portion of the penalty phase? Right. I understand. You also understand that just as you had in the first phase of the trial, you can choose not to testify and just rely on the evidence that's already been presented during the defense portion of the penalty phase. You understand that? Yes, I do. And other, other than the, uh, your testimony, just stepping back for a moment, uh, is there any other evidence that you believe should be presented during the penalty phase of, of the trial, but as far as the defense portion? Any other witnesses, any other evidence of any kind? And evidence means anything that you can think of, basically. Photographs, audio recording, video recording, fingerprints, anything at all. Well, yeah, in fact, uh, yeah. I mean, um, all this <clears throat> discussion about, you know, proof and my, my credibility within the Federal Bureau of Prisons as being an inmate, um, Pound for pound, I'm probably the most honest inmate that I've ever met in my 25 years in the Bureau. Um, I can back it up with uh, file lawsuits. Nothing's ever been, everything's gone to summary judgment. Um, I've never filed uh, anything. I've filed many administrative remedies. I mean, pound for pound, I'm a very honest person. What I say, I can prove. Anything that comes out of my mouth, I can prove. Well, I Mr. Can Nelson, I get it. And I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't, I don't understand if that's an answer to my question. I'm thinking, other than what you may testify to, is there any, are you referring to some other evidence that you think should be introduced during your penalty phase other than your testimony? I'm sorry, I got off the track there just for a second, Your Honor. Um, well, there is a lot of things from United States Senator Bernie Sanders that I, I went through his office for congressional inquiries for over a decade from 96 to 2016 or 17. And uh, he wouldn't waste his time with someone that was dishonest. So, I mean, there is those records. I mean- What, I what records are you referring to? Well, the, the uh, records from his office that for congressional inquiries. I mean, he's made at least, with no exaggeration, two dozen or more. I guess, what, what are you referring to that Listen to my question and then to, to make sure that because I want to make sure you understand my question and then maybe I'll understand your answer. So what records do you believe are in Senator Bernie Sanders' office that you believe should be admitted into evidence in this penalty phase of your trial here today? Yes, sir. Uh, what are you referring to? Well, what I'm referring to is when I took, we took a complaint and I send it to the United States Senator Bernie Sanders. He takes that complaint and he sends it to whatever office I choose. For instance, the, the central office of the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Washington, D.C. He'll send it there to Congressional Affairs. They will investigate and run an investigation and find out what's going on with the complaint. As a result, for instance, one example, the warden of the facility responded to Senator Sanders and said, listen, he's going to get his colostomy changed, sir, and he's going to get his halfway house before he gets released. And I got none of that. And this is signed by the warden himself. I mean, these are, these are, these are factual things. As far as the prison rape, I was beaten and raped, and, and the staff allowed this to happen. They, they allowed me to walk around general population with a black eye so bad that it was completely swole shut. 100% swole shut. Lieutenants, everybody stopped me. Hey, hey, buddy, come here. What, what is uh, Mr. Nelson, it, let's... Okay. You mentioned as far, as far as this, you just stated the way you phrased it as beaten and rape. Right. Are you saying there, there has been evidence solicited from some of the defense witnesses, and it's... And some, certain things are referenced in some of the records. What are you saying? Are you saying there's some other record that provides proof that you were beaten, beaten and raped that is not part of what's in evidence now? Well, I think what it comes down to, Your Honor, is the fact that, you know, I'm being truthful and a lot of things try to get pushed under the rug by the Bureau. And I'm just saying that 
that anything that I say shouldn't be just brushed off like I'm some impulsive liar or some embellishments or something. I can prove what I'm saying. And in terms of, to the extent you seem to be referring to corroboration, is there some other, other than yourself, is there some other witness that you think should be called to testify to corroborate anything you just said, corroborate anything any of the other witnesses have said, corroborate anything else that's in any of the documents that have been put into the evidence by the defense? I believe there are, sir, but I'm not going to delay the trial. Um, I'm just going to let it go as it is. I would like to testify. So you believe there are witnesses? Oh, sure. I mean, absolutely. Who, who are they? I mean, I, I, I would need a moment to, you know, uh, to pen and paper and to figure out, you know, which one would be the most, you know, uh, uh, likely candidate to be called before the court. Have you provided those names uh, and no. any contact information to any of your attorneys? No, I've never, we've never discussed this. Okay. Do you need a moment to talk with the, your attorneys about these witnesses that you believe exist that you've never told them about? Oh, no, they right? do exist. I mean, you know, these are people that work for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I mean, have you, so you have not told your attorneys about who these people are? No. Okay. Do you want a moment to talk with your attorneys about who these people are so they can give you some advice, talk about what options you may have? No, no, I don't, Your Honor. I guess what I'm trying to say now is finally, my final answer here is this, is that I'll get up and I'll testify. I just don't want to be badgered by the prosecution here in, in like I'm in trying to make me, paint me up as some racist, no, excuse me, that was before, uh, paint me up as a, some uh, liar or embellishing person when, in fact, we could get people brought down here and delay the trial and get them down here and put them on the stand and ask them questions. Hey, well, who are the people? Well, I mean, I, I can t I'll, I come, I'll create a list for you. I mean, these are employees. I mean, lieutenants, officers. I mean, you know, uh, people. I can think of one right off my head. I mean, L Lieutenant Grieve. I mean, Lieutenant Grieve, he works for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. His last place he was employed in the year. Lieutenant Grieve? Grieve, uh, G-R-I-E-V-E. -E. Okay. Lieutenant Grieve in um, United States Penitentiary, Lee County, Virginia. Um, Anyone else that you can yeah. identify? Um, I, I would have to have a couple minutes with a pen and paper over lunch, and I could come up with a list. I, I mean, these names will pop right in my head. I'm just saying that these individuals would would corroborate everything I'm saying. Absolutely. Any other any other witnesses that, that you can think of in terms of their names that you have right right here that you can tell me? Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm weighing them all out. I mean, uh, I, I'd have to, I, I need a few minutes to get my mind together, sir. Okay. Put, put them together. I, I promise you I can come up with this minute, several names. Just, it would take me a moment. I'm like under the gun, if you will. All right. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our lunch recess in, the, in a moment. Uh, during the le lunch recess, uh, Mr. Nelson, you need to, to get this list together of, of witnesses. You need to compile a list of any other exhibits, documents, or any other evidence that you believe, other than your own testimony, that you believe should be presented. Because when we come back, and then, and then you need to get that together ASAP, you need to talk with your attorneys about it. Yep. And then when we come back, we can talk about that. Yep. And then after we've talked about all that, then we will go forward and talk about whether you're going to testify. And you can also talk with your attorneys during lunch in view of what you've already presented, in view of this additional information that you'll be providing your attorneys for the very first time. Talk about all of that, and then we can have a discussion when we come back from lunch. Okay, Your Honor. All right. Um, anything else from the state before we go into lunch recess? No, Judge. Anything else from the defense before we go on lunch recess? No, Your Honor, just the other two motions I'd like to address then. I'll take a look at those uh, by uh, my earliest opportunity. Hopefully, I'll have a chance during lunch. Anything else, uh, Mr. Nelson, before we take a lunch recess? No, Your Honor. All right. All right, we'll be in lunch recess till 1.30 p.m. this afternoon. Have a good lunch.